and talk about how, how you know, what Buns is doing and how it's doing it, why it's doing it, uh, and then maybe we kind of go into more informal conversation. Cool. Perfect. Let's go into screen share mode here. So uh, I'm going to start off by walking through uh, the, the deck kind of we talked about at or shared at um, Radical Change. So really, Bun started as a, a bartering community. Uh, there's about 310,000 users that use the app, 2.5 million items on the app. Uh, we completed over a million transactions since launching. Really, it's you know very deeply rooted in community. Um, to talk about the bartering marketplace, um, there's 30 million pages per month, 2.5 million items posted, uh, 40 million messages, 1 million trades completed, and 10 million searches. Um, so the problem with classic bartering economies is, is that you typically have a value uh, medium of exchange issue. Um, so you have, it's almost that they, you're almost engineering the environment to uh, that, or, or the environmental conditions to create a currency, um, you know, bartering kind of birth the US dollar and a lot of other natural currencies as we understand them or fiat currencies as we, as we understand them today. Um, so BITS is a currency that we created to uh, increase the total number of transactions flowing through the infrastructure or the network. Um, so there's 3.2 million transactions that have occurred in BITS uh, since we launched 11 months ago. Uh, people have spent $1.4 million peer-to-peer -peer and 200 shops accept BITS across uh, Canada. So they're accepted in uh, Ottawa, Vancouver, Montreal, Toronto, uh, Hamilton, and uh, we're launching in a number of other cities we'll get to later. Um, but really the key number here that's super important is that uh, $1 million has been spent at local shops. Uh, so people have literally earned value for their data um, and spent it at local, uh, local shops across Canada. Um, we also have this thing called the daily airdrop. Uh, you know, uh, there's over 2 million customer insights that have been generated from that. So brands are really paying customers for uh, engagement with them. Uh, people obviously really love buns, lots of awesome stuff. We're trending right now at the top of the list and maybe Toronto. So the problem we're solving though is really major social networks, uh, marketplaces and banks create wall uh, gardens of customer data. Businesses need a way to use the data and to uh, own their customer relationship and customers need a way to uh, own the value that's derived from their data and a choice in how they use it. Uh, to give you some sort of context of the sense of the economy today, when we're looking at how we create or take existing demand uh, for data or attention and um, you know repackage it crypto becomes like the method by which we repackage and distribute in a secure form um, that, that that value but annually you know 325 billion dollars is spent on digital advertising um, so really what we believe is that the sharing economy what the sharing economy did for liquidity of cars and houses the data economy will do for people's data and attention and contributions to networks um, so really uh, bits are earned for data attention and contribution to the community um, and when a brand buys bits, 60%, uh, we call it the 60% promise, 60% of the value uh, uh, that the brands pay us, so, like, so let's say it's $10,000, uh, is now circulated to the community for engaging in their intention. Um, so it would circulate 600,000 bits into the community. Um, so why now? Really, current platforms have lost trust. Uh, user perception of data and privacy is changing. Platforms are at risk of feature ubiquity. Feature ubiquity is probably best described by what happened with Snapchat. Uh, so Snapchat had this amazing differentiator, which was ephemeral video messaging. Uh, Facebook, now YouTube, uh, Instagram, everything has it. So really, features are ubiquitous, and you know, differentiation will come at a different level, um, more model breaking. Um, so why now again, going back there, cryptocurrencies give us a new asset class, a secure form of transmission and storage. And lastly, no one's returning value derived from data attention uh, and work to its rightful owners, people. Um, to give you some sort of kind of idea of, I'm jumping through a couple things here, of what we're about to launch. We're launching social zones whereby you can use bits that you've earned for your data attention and contribution to the network to establish a zone. And you can actually charge a fee in bits for other members to uh, participate in that zone. So essentially, the data economy that we're creating um, uh, provides and solves a problem that other networks don't solve today, which is that administrators, community builders, and moderators of zones are actually uh, compensated for their work. Um, you'll also be able to earn bits for growing your community, um, managing the community, um, for contributing to a community. These are lots of different ways. Um, I'm jumping through a couple of them that are less interesting. Um, but Speaker's Corner is really cool. It's a video functionality. It's almost like the same way uh, advertisers or brands are able to reach customers and pay them instead of paying platforms. Um, Speaker's Corner, what it does is really uh, allow people to use that same attention economics principle and reach other people. So 
Um, depending on the demand at the moment, you can hold down this button, record a video. Uh, that video will show on the home screen and you'll be able to reach people with your message the same way brands can reach you with their message using bits. Um, yeah, what else is interesting? We have a POS that's in beta. Um, so I think it's in six of the 20 shops right now. It's coming out of beta. Uh, it's uh, just kind of our approach at how we make this as usable as possible. Like, if we're going to redirect the value of about 300 billion annually or over 300 billion annually uh, to users, um, everyone has to be able to participate. So um, one of the things that most people don't kind of understand about funds, and I'll show you by jumping out of this presentation um, and going into uh, the funds, uh, funds com, is, let me go here, share. Uh, here we go. Okay. So I'm on funds.com. Everyone can see that, I hope, right? Yep. Cool. Uh, here's my wallet. Um, I can view my wallet and in my wallet, I have the ability to withdraw to Ethereum mainnet. So I can set a certain amount of bits that I want to withdraw and set an Ethereum address and withdraw those funds to uh, Ethereum mainnet where I can hold them as an ERC-223. And the reason we structured it this way is so that if there's this data economy and this $300 billion annually is going to be redistributed in value to everyone who participates in their attention, um, there shouldn't be a technical barrier in participation. But, you know, uh, the responsibility that comes with ownership of a currency like this, everyone says, like, you know, not your keys, not your coins. Um, that, that responsibility is really optional. Um, and if you want to take that responsibility, you're welcome to. Um, but it's not necessarily forced on everyone, which would prohibit growth and adoption of our, our, our application and our network. Um, so that's kind of how that works. Anytime you're on the Buns app um, and you're scrolling through stuff and you see yellow dots with numbers, that's how much the other person wants for this particular item. Um, so it's 3,500 bits for this particular item. I can just make an offer. Um, I can go down into the chat. I've actually done a transaction with this person in the past. Can you guys see my screen still? Yeah. Okay, cool. I can go down to the chat. Um, I can say like, hey, I want this. I want it. And then uh, so you can see that the item appeared in the chat for context. I can hit send bits. I'm going to send them. Does anyone remember what the amount of bits was? I think it was 1,500. Uh, yeah. Maybe 35? Anyways. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, I sent him 50,000. <laughs> I enter my pin um, and I sent payment. So now this person has 1,500 bits uh, from me. Um, so they have the ability as well to send it to Ethereum mainnet if they want to and hold it in it, their, my user wallet or whatever it may be. So that's just a really high level. I think it's probably a good opportunity to just pause and talk a bit about um, what we're doing and why. Um, really, like, I think our, our approach has been very different than a lot of the folks maybe um, that have been infrastructure first. Um, you know, it, it's really amazing. And I think we, we you know, we, we kind of take the approach of making a product that's usable for everybody that kind of connects to main, you know, mainstream infrastructure and then gives them the optionality and choices to whether or not they want to participate in this new kind of economy um, and slowly kind of bridges the gaps. Like, I think we need to uh, and we also, we, another really interesting thing we did that was kind of different was that we didn't allow people to buy the currency. Um, uh, you know, there's obviously in the last 11 months, people have earned a million dollars in this stuff and spent it. Um, but the reason we didn't want people to, to uh, buy it was because uh, we wanted to identify an existing uh, channel of demand and use that channel of demand to um, kind of uh, funnel the, the existing uh, currency or existing fiat demand for something into this currency and use it as a, a mechanism to kind of package up uh, what we would describe as uh, uh, money backed by the demand for data um, or data backed money. Um, so that's kind of why we did that. It's a really different approach. Um, so that way the, the demand for the data is an ongoing reoccurring flow of value rather than um, someone purchasing it uh, and, and speculating on it. Um, so it's a very different approach. Um, but that's yeah. Kind of, um, yeah. yeah, this is awesome. Sasha, thank you very much for sharing. And uh, this is, yeah, like my intuition when I first saw this was this is like a really interesting experiment that I haven't been seeing all that much of, even in Ethereum world, which we spend most of our time in, um, just kind of like in, in the communities. The Specifically, you know, you can't buy this currency. It's only something that you can be, that can be earned. Um, Data-backed money, I think, is really interesting. I, I think maybe just to touch on data-backed money for a second, could you talk about, obviously, you've brought up the different ways that you can earn BTZ, but um, like, could you just expand on what data-backed money means to you and, yeah, sure. and why it should exist and, and 
perhaps you know how this is the right time you, you mentioned? Yeah, so I, I think what it comes down to is um, th there's this huge amount of demand in the real world today for data and for attention. Um, we can quantify that in the existing amounts of money that flow through the internet. Data is the, really the native currency of the internet. Um, and so uh, the demand for it, um, instead of having it reside within centralized organizations like Facebook or any of the kind of large institutions that connect people to large networks of people to advertise, um, what if we took that same demand, repackaged it, and allowed people to use it in a liquid format? Um, and that's kind of where, how we see you know, what we're doing. It's really about uh, value distribution and the, uh, the ability for businesses to redeem against treasury for uh, accepting this currency. So a brand has paid uh, to engage with a customer. A customer receives bits. Those bits entitle them to redemption against treasury, or they can use a peer-to-peer -peer with no redemption against treasury. Um, and so if it's spent at a shop, then the shop has the ability now to uh, redeem it against treasury to get fiat, or the shop will have the ability in the coming future, a couple, a couple months, to use that currency to do other things on the network to reach more customers. So um, it's almost like a, when we just describe it, it's actually not like um, there's no inherent invested value that is data related outside of the fact that it's only earned for data related activities. Right. So it's backed right. by the demand, which is a funnel of value that is being kind of farmed by us currently. Um, right. so but the customers or I guess the businesses that are kind of understanding the value here are, uh, you know, while Simple has, has, has done an, a bits airdrop, uh, Coho yeah. has done a bits airdrop, Lyft has just agreed to do a bits airdrop with us, uh, and a bunch of others. And so I think what they're looking at it as is an alternative to pay people rather than paying platforms. Um, because right now in tra traditional, the traditional data economy, there is no mechanism by which you can distribute value to the network participants. Um, and so this kind of creates a channel to do that. Yeah. Did you say, was that Lyft that she said? Yeah. Okay, so how, like, how, how does that work? What, what, what does Lyft um, do? Do they pay to you in USD or in um, fiat? And then you turn that into this and distribute that just peer to peer to anyone who interacts with Lyft on the site? Okay, so daily airdrop will ask, let's, let's just use the example of what Wellsimple did, right? So Wellsimple asked, like, are you, how are you, how are you, uh, so Wellsimple will agree to a certain amount of uh, investment into uh, the airdrop. And 60% of that value will get converted in a, at a fixed rate to bits. So if it's $10,000, 60% uh, of that is $600,000 in re redeemable value. So 600,000 bits will get allocated and people will be able to engage with the daily airdrop survey until those 600,000 bits are completely depleted. So, um, so the question they'll ask is like, hey, uh, you know, how, how are you thinking about saving? Like answer one is, uh, I, you know, how are you saving today? It's like, I save in my checking account. I save in my, my investment account. I have a self-directed RSP. I have a TFSA, whatever type of vehicle they're using, or I don't use it at all. Now that value, that, that value to the, the business or to Wellsimple is that later they'll be able to engage with those customers in a highly relevant way, knowing how they responded to that survey. But the value to the customer is the customer gives the business insights and then the business can then action those insights later. But the customer is now compensated for that, that insight. Um, so th that's kind of how at a basic mechanical level it works. So yep. Lyft survey hasn't gone live yet. Um, we're just excited to have them as a partner, but uh, Airbnb, not Airbnb, so excuse me, um, Coho's and Wealth Symbols have gone live. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's super cool. And it makes a lot of sense. And I think this speaks to, you know, making your, your users in, in a, Kind of basic sense owners of their own information um and i and i wonder how you think about it like even past that so they definitely are owners of their own information in this kind of in these campaigns that they can be, can monetize their answers to to these types of questions and many other actions on the site um to kind of be self-sovereign uh, but how do you think about them in the context of funds do you think of them as as part owners of the system if so like how do you how do you think about uh, I think yeah, I think about them as community members um, and like contributors to the value of the network. Yeah. I think like without them, it's the perfect, I think the best example I usually use to kind of answer this one is like, if you take all the users away from Facebook, no VC would touch it because essentially it's a graveyard of, of like software. And like with, with, with uh, features becoming so ubiquitous, like, you know, there's open repos of chat apps and video functionality and this and that, like 
So like the question is, is like the, the, the real clear kind of indicator to me is that the community is where the value is. And we need to respect people and their, their information and their participation in their work, data as work, right? Um, so I think, I think that the way we see it is like, these are community members just like us. Um, and yep. uh, the, the contributions to the network should be proportionally rewarded uh, based on the value derived from that contribution. Uh, be it data, attention, or work. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think that's kind of how we see it. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying. Um, I will open it up for questions after this last one. And we probably have five minutes after this question. Um, my last question uh, is just saying that I think it was really interesting uh, when you talked about future ubiquity and then value distribution being the space where where people will and businesses will compete in the future. Um, I guess... Just to expand upon that a little bit more, um, what, what do you think the next steps are here? Do you think like tokenization is the place where value distribution, um, you know, where, where we should be focused as a community is thinking about these, these different token structures? Um, do you think there's other ways that value distribution um, can be used as a, as a, um, a differentiating factor? Just curious to get thoughts there, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, like I think it'll become an arms race to 100% value distribution. That's what I believe. Um, our goal is to get to 100% of the total value derived from data attention and uh, contributions to the network uh, paid. So 100% of the value paid directly to users by 2030. Um, ambitious goal, a lot of work to do to get there. Um, but I think that, so I think, I think that uh, that's not the only way to look at it. I think like, you know, the same way, I think like the last maybe year was almost governed by um, material demand being or dictated to, dictated by speculative speculative speculation on currencies or in some of them having some sort of demand or, or pricing based on you know cost of running servers for mining and stuff like there's there's, there's different different ways to look at it and I think we look at it from a demand perspective in the real world um, like what if you know you know a good friend Ethan Buckman and I were, were out recently discussing like what if you could back a currency by the future uh, the future production value of a farm because the food has uh, a very liquid market and uh, you could actually have the token redeemable for, for the subgranic produce, or you could simply sell the produce to back the tokens liquidity in the market as well. So I think like the way we look at it personally is really around like, how do we create or take existing demand and package it into this new secure and trans, you know, uh, secure form uh, that's, that can be transacted in um, and distribute that to people for, you know, in, in, essentially re, re, reassess our social contract, whereby like today the social contract is, you know, we built this awesome software and you get to use it for free, but we get to like use your data. And, you know, like that social contract's broken. Like how do we redefine that to say like, you know, people are the rightful owners of their data. Uh, the value derived from it should be paid to people. Um, how do we make meaningful progress to get there? Um, and so these are some of the things that we think about. Uh, that's it. Yeah, very interesting um, and exciting. Uh, it's been really good chatting. Um, I will open it up. I think most folks have the um, the rights to unmute. I think there's a couple of people I didn't get to yet, but feel free to unmute if you have any questions. Um, and I'll kind of like go through the chat and see if anything came up there. There are no questions. We can talk about maybe my opinion on uh, how we can progressively decentralize the infrastructure as well. Um, I think yeah. that's a, kind of a key piece that is right now. Obviously, we built a bridge from uh, Buns to with uh, Chainsafe, uh, who are close friends of ours. We built a bridge to Ethereum mainnet where we we're able to move the tokens or bits too. Um, but we have plans also to, you know, I think there's no reason. There should be a reason for why it's important um, to decentralize the infrastructure. Um, and how do we ensure that that's built to demand? I think that's a really interesting piece as well. Because again, we're not traditional in the regard that we're not coming from an infrastructure first um, build. We actually have this pretty significant user base of over 300,000 people and a huge number of transactions. And now we're actually feeling that the pressure and the responsibility to ensure that uh, the, the wallet transaction layer and identity, particularly de-identified information resides um, on an infrastructure that's distributed. Hmm. Yeah, this is really interesting. And I think leads well to some stuff I was reading in Dan's liquid liberal radicalism. Um, yeah. 
uh, article. So I think it, it may fit well there. But yeah, I'm curious Yeah, if there's anything that you're thinking um, with regards to that, uh, at least in the short to medium term, would be worth Yeah, worth I mean, we've been discussing, um, there have been some discussions with, uh, you know, the team at Chainsafe and some of the, our team, our technical team here, um, around how we would design an infrastructure and who would run it. Um, and like who would be, you know, how, how would the, if it's you know, going to be a staking based infrastructure, how is that going to be, you know, uh, what are the participants obligations going to be? How is that going to be structured? Um, and uh, so I think we really view the important, most important pieces within the infrastructure to be like, if you don't need to put everything on chain, if I put everything on chain, uh, the amount of like information would be outrageous. Um, right. so I think, so we look at it as like the wallet, um, the transaction uh, rail and the identity components, particularly storing the, the uh, individual's data, um, are really the most kind of critical components that should not be in our ownership in the longer term. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so I think those are the key pieces, which is like how about, you know, where the, where the source of the value is, is pers the person, uh, how the value is captured is the, is the wallet, and how the value is transmitted is the rail. Um, and so, so really that whole value life cycle is super important to, to eventually progressively decentralize it in a really secure and careful way. Mm -hmm. um, but kind of, again, like coming from a place of centralization and moving into that space, um, we kind of uh, get the benefit of being able to scale easily to users uh, who can interact with it. And they have again right. a choice if they want it to go to Ethereum mainnet as an ERC-223. And if not, right. they can progressive, we can progressively rip and replace our infrastructure to do that. Um, so I think that's really kind of a key piece for us as well. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I, I think we feel the benefits of that by being built, you know, so closely tied to GitHub. Um, there's there's kind of the progressive nature of being able to use what, what exists currently while knowing that we're working diligently towards that future. That's that's interesting. Can we say? Yeah. Cool. Any, yeah. Any other questions or no? Let's see. Anything else from the crowd? Last call. Sasha, this has been great. Yeah, thanks, man. I, we're definitely going to throw up some bounties coming up. I think uh, I know I've been talking to Perry, our CTO, and uh, we'd love to figure out a way to collaborate with you guys. We were chatting about this last I saw you. Um, yeah. So, yeah. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Well, hope you can stick around for a little bit. I think this next part may be, be of interest to you. And Sasha, thanks again for, for taking sure, yeah. time. And Daniel, it's yeah, great. I'll, uh, I'll hey. try to help you get started in Portland, man. There's there's only three three posts in Portland right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So but, we'll be launching. But I'll work on it. We just actually made our, our first hire in San Francisco. Um, so uh, we'll be launching in San Francisco, New York, uh, LA, and Tokyo this year. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah. cool. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sasha. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we will welcome Bowtie Friday Dan to the stage. Dan, Hi. as you may, <clears throat> must know by now. <laughs> is, I don't know uh, why you're not wearing one. Uh, yeah, I, I, it fell. It's weird. I don't know. It's invisible. Um, if you may be able to tell from the fox behind Dan, uh, Dan works. Uh, <laughs> Dan works uh, as a as a co-founder of MetaMask um, today. I think he's focusing a little bit more on the liberal radicalism work that I'm thinking about, but I guess time will tell. We're really excited to have Dan, uh, Dan present and, and let us know what he's been thinking about. Cool. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And, and thanks so much, Sasha. That was like, uh, really it's, I, I love, I love the approach. Like, like it's, it's cool to see yeah, real users on a product and how you're, how you're easing them into the blockchain infrastructure. And there are a million ways that I almost want to rework my talk to just like, directly engage with it because I think there's so many great conversation starters you just you just threw out there. Yeah. Um, Maybe next time we'll, we'll connect uh, another time to discuss some of the quadratic voting and uh, kind of um, Harvard we taxation models that. we're exploring as well. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I'll, uh, I think I was initially <clears throat> invited here because I, I wrote a little article about, uh, you know, liquid uh, radicalism and, and these great people at Gitcoin have done some incredible, like they're pioneering the actual experimentation with li li liquid uh, or liberal radicalism, which is just amazing. Uh, I love seeing these experiments actually tried out. Um, this article, uh, it was called like, oh, right. So they're doing liberal ra radicalism. I just proposed liquid, which is just to say that uh, I, I was saying if you uh, decouple some of the core components that we can, uh, we can kind of suss out some bonus features um, just by kind of uh, letting some of the different layers uh, decide on how they 
interact with the other layers. Um, so, so in this case, it, I'm going to kind of assume everybody knows uh, liberal radicalism. And so, so here we've got some people who want to match donations. These are nice patrons. They're very kind. And so they're going to, in my case, I, I was really attacking the identity registry notion. You know, it's, it's one thing to say we're going to accept anyone with a GitHub profile, but you know, there, there is the potential that somebody creates multiple GitHub profiles. So uh, we, we might allow multiple strategies. So if this is GitHub profiles, maybe this is, uh, you know, the a local, uh, I don't know, a meetup that signed everybody and gave out an NFT, or this is, a, you know, just you making all your friends. So now you can donate basically saying, okay, depending on how they identify people, and this one identifies A, and this one identifies A and B, um, now the, it's going to split up my donation based on uh, basically the, li uh, the liberal radicalism e equation uh, using basically hedging between those registries. So I could say, for example, I trust C 90%, but the, uh, you know, B is going to be my fallback. So I'm going to put 10% of my uh, money in C or maybe B and C are two different regions. And so I just want to cover more uh, people distributed around the world. And so uh, anyways, this was just like a way of kind of breaking apart uh, liberal radicalism in a way that um, is really expressing a composition method that I tend to view things through. Um, so rather than like dive deep on liberal radicalism, because I think that you guys are probably bigger experts on it, honestly, than I am. Um, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to dive a little bit on my latest uh, articulation of some ideas that I've been talking about a lot. Won't be totally new for a lot of you, but I'm going to put them in, I think, uh, as a, a form of kind of call to action for the Ethereum community. Uh, this is definitely a kind of infrastructure first uh, talk, um, kind of to contrast with the last one. Um, so, so what I'm what I'm going to say is these these arrows and, and how we're choosing to compose them. You know, I'm I'm saying I don't want to hard code in a single registry. I want to be able to be dynamic. So, what what does that mean to to create these ties? And what is the composition uh, atom uh, for smart contracts that we should be using? And I would argue that they're object capabilities. And this is a 60 year old security model, um, but it has not become uh, widespread yet. And I would argue and uh, there are some great uh, reasons that the Ethereum community should adopt it as a base atom of composition. Um, they have uh, composition security, and they also have enormous scalability uh, models. So both computational and social. So I'm going to show how this minimizes on-chain activity, as well as allows for very dynamic social uh, d interactions and uh, arrangements, kind of like we were seeing with uh, liquid liberal radicalism. So. Uh, the very dictionary definition of an object capability, it's uh, just an unforgeable reference that gives you permission to do something and you're able to grant it to someone else. Um, so in, in the code sense, that means either you're initialized with a permission, like you're initialized with file system access or access to a specific file, um, or you were given it basically. So meaning all permissions in an object capability model are totally explicit. There's no uh, ambient authority, right? There's no, um, for example, um, a TX, uh, sender, right, is a kind of an ambient authority issue. People never know whether they should check the, the sender or the message uh, forwarder. Um, but, but if we come up with a consistent pattern, maybe we won't have those, uh, those issues. Um, one metaphor for OCAP that I would kind of suggest is just think of it as a power. Like, this is a power you have. Okay, so it could be the key to your house, the right to enter a concert, uh, or just some pizza tokens, you know. Um, or we were talking just a second ago about investing in farm futures. These could be rights to some future farmer's yield. Okay, but in particular, it's not just a token. Um, it has a kind of off-chain delegatable property. So almost like fire, you can just like light somebody else's, it becomes brighter. At the time of withdrawal, they diminish the total thing. So there is a notion of making something exclusive and that's the heart of uh, creating atomic uh, transactions. But in the meanwhile, things are delegatable. So as long as you don't need exclusive authority, you can extend new permissions freely entirely off chain. So I'm gonna look at a couple things in Ethereum today that already resemble this. Like people keep on inventing this, people keep on, keep on almost inventing it, <laughs> uh, but without a little bit of uh, foundation in, in just like the theory that we got like 60 years of, uh, of literature on this and it's a very well-defined thing. There's a lot to learn from it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over some things right now. And then I'm going to go in a little more detail, and then we're going to revisit them. So the first one's the token allowance method. It's like the thing that lets you interact with exchanges, right? You allow another contract to withdraw from you. Um, 
that, that is one example. Meta transactions, I would argue, are an example of a capability because you signed a message that now gives somebody else permission to broadcast a uh, transaction on your behalf. Now, it's a very restricted capability, right? They only have permission to send that one transaction, but it's still an option for them, right? They don't have to. They could reject it if the transaction was bad for them. Um, protocol relayers on the 0x network, uh, those, those uh, uh, cell orders are absolutely a type of capability uh, in that anyone with the message can now redeem it on chain to uh, call a function that initiates a trade. Subscriptions, um, you know, a, another, another Gitcoin kind of pioneering project. Um, this is a thing where you're granting somebody else permission to withdraw from your account um, within some certain parameters. Um, so it's basically giving someone a function reference. Uh, and then uh, I, I can, I'm going to save time a little bit by not explaining why I think that state channels and plasma chains can be modeled as capabilities right now, but I have an article uh, on that that I will, I'll share soon. Um, one important thing about a capability. So if we think of it as just a function reference, is that they're entirely a delegatable and attenuable. Attenuable is just to say that you can uh, refine the scope of it. So if I have a function like open my door, um, I can give it to you or I can give it to you with some extra constraints. So for example, if my door has a can open function and uh, I can now give it to my kooky friend with uh, just this weekend. So now I can put arbitrary constraints on it and we can just pass those around freely, okay? Um, now we can manage, uh, I'll uh, model it briefly in two different ways. Here's entirely on chain, okay? So we could imagine I have a contract account. If every single identity has a contract account, right? You know, the door has got a contract account. I am, uh, Bob and Charles both have one. Um, so then what this, these contract accounts have, they have a plugin system that lets other contracts send transactions on their behalf. So in this case, the door grants this plugin permission to send any transaction. And that contract gives Bob the permission to send uh, transactions, but only the open function and only from Bob. So, so this, this contract itself is a, it's a, all of the authorization and it's all of the uh, access to that function. So this function won't accept anything. Right now the door may not accept uh, calls from anything except for this. And then Bob now, his account can actually give permission to send transactions from his account, but he can say, um, actually, uh, I'll let you send uh, messages to this, uh, but um, only this weekend and only from Charles. Oh, actually, he probably should have also said only to uh, this plugin, right, to complete the composition. In this case, Charles can uh, actually send anything uh, from him this weekend. So little, little vulnerability there, but uh, the point is, uh, it, it would ideally have a pointer to the other capability, and that's what we see in this example. We have a message that gives Bob the open function, and then we've got like a signature of its hash. So this can be a totally off-chain message. And now to delegate it, Bob can just sign a message that has a reference to that function. And so now entirely off-chain, like we, we literally only needed the setup to know how to read this chain of messages for Bob to now share a very specific permission and Charles can redeem it at any time he wants. Um, some, some kinds of delegations do require on-chain state. For example, if you were say, sharing a permission, so $100 a day, like a subscription to someone to pay their salary, you're gonna need to save on chain uh, how much money they have access to. So while all of those permissions can be extended off chain, at the time of withdrawal, there needs to be something published to the blockchain. So that would be a sort of counterfactual publication. So there's some reminiscence uh, between this and the counterfactual pattern. And I think a lot of the lessons from counterfactual can apply here. Uh, the create two op code can totally apply because we need deterministic uh, addresses for this. If I give you a daily spending key and then you spend uh, $20 of it, I need to be able to, uh, when, when you make another withdrawal later, we need it to be checked against the previous withdrawal. And so we need consistent deterministic addresses for counterfactually published contracts. Um, okay, so let's look back at those previous examples and see how they could work if they were implemented with delegatable off-chain messages, okay? Um, so the token allowance method, uh, if they had all of that, then we'd have similar features except um, the, the setup uh, transaction would be optional, so we're saving half the interactions on the blockchain, um, and it would also be delegatable, which uh, I actually didn't get too creative with that. I, I'm pretty sure you could chain together exchanges, have multi-hop things, and that would just be like a natural uh, composition benefit. Uh, meta transactions, how could we uh, benefit from that? Well, sites promising to pay users on a user's behalf could, you could grant limits. I, I think 
the usual thing is you already have a pool that you're limiting, but you're usually uh, probably granting to a user at a time. Uh, here you could you could have an allowance to many many users, and you're only paying for them at the time of withdraw. Furthermore, you can invite users who can then further uh, invite their friends. So you get a very natural kind of viral invite scheme where users get to bypass the crypto onboarding experience uh, and get their transaction fees paid for themselves. Uh, and this works even without a uh, company sponsor. This can work with uh, just chains of friends that just want to, you know, one friend with a little crypto could be enough to pay the gas fees for a number of their friends who want to just, you know, bootstrap their farm or whatever. Um, if 0x protocol had this, you, and then you'd be able to uh, delegate uh, orders. So instead of just having single re relayers, um, I could be like a sub relayer who takes those messages and then signs them a second time so that I'm like getting uh, delegated a, a fee from that. Um, I'd have to uh, go into that a little more. Subscriptions, again, we could do away with the initial setup message. Um, and they're also delegatable. And I really like this one because a subscription service could itself subscribe to services with its own subscriptions. So futures of your subscription services could be used to plug into your own, meaning you don't need to have money in the bank to set up your supply chain. So we could have like liquid, continuous supply chains where money doesn't sit still, it, it's fluid and frees up, uh, you know, sitting capital. I think that that one's huge. Um, uh, state channels, I, again, state channels and plasma chains, I'm not going to go into it. I'm pretty sure that you can uh, compose entirely dynamic layer two scaling networks uh, as object capabilities. And if you do, what you can do is uh, you create a state channel. And what it's saying is we've got a multi-sig. It has a time lock. So there's a challenge period. And then only updates by two people. But now you can take your right to sign that update and you can delegate it to let's say a quorum of two of three or something. And now you've got a quasi uh, plasma chain or something. Um, so either you or the two of three, et cetera. Um, I think that we can use this composition method to create uh, composable and dynamic uh, layer two scaling solutions. Um, the weight on chain, um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, when, when I first pitched this uh, to Austin actually, he, uh, his concern was immediately and correctly that the, the length of these delegation chains in cases where the delegations are long be expensive to compute on chain. Um, I think you can solve that in a couple of ways, although I'm not trying to prescribe technical solutions here. I'm trying to imbue general concepts. Um, one of them would be if you have a challenge period, then just like state channels and plasma, you don't need to submit the whole chain, right? The whole point of scaling blockchains and letting them interact is you, you pr produce the uh, header state and you only need to provide additional state if there's a challenge or if you need more block confirmations or something. So I think that there's a chance for that. Also, advanced cryptography like ZK Rollup, I think could do this, where you uh, condense many signatures into a single proof. Um, so I'm really excited to see um, with this paradigm, what like the latest cryptog cryptography can offer in allowing us uh, kind of robust things. Also data availability, it's like a constant plague for layer two scaling solutions. They're like, oh, Plasma, what if you try to exit and then they keep challenging and then they don't provide it. Um, here, since capabilities imbue power, every single person granted with power has a natural in incentive equal to that power's value to them to store and back up that power. So we have like data storage value alignment. Um, I think that it, that's important because it lets you align the costs of storage with the people who uh, are invested in storing it. Um, just a cool perk. Um, uh, if you want to know how this helps scaling, um, I recommend reading this article uh, by uh, Brooklyn Zelenka. Um, uh, she she's, thinks the, oh, okay. Well, anyways, I'll, I'll post this uh, article uh, here in the chat, huh? Where are, where's the chat right now? I, I'll uh, find it in a little bit, I guess. Oh, here we go. There we go. And um, so, yeah, anyways, this is, it. it uh, the object capability model has a tight relationship to the actor model. Which, in which each uh, contract or actor basically is a concurrent process. And when you isolate these uh, capabilities and their invocations as just messages um, and assume everything is async from the beginning, um, you have wonderful uh, scaling uh, properties. Everything is concurrent. Everything talks to each other uh, at, at, their, uh, at their leisure. And there's, there's good coding uh, patterns for that, which I talk about in just a second. Um, I'm from MetaMask, so people surely expect me to talk about the wallet. I think the wallet plays a key role here because when you're connecting to an app, 
um, you want to expose the least possible risk. And I think that that's the key thing that object capabilities really do. They let you specify exactly what the uh, service or uh, collaborator or other person needs to cooperate with you, and you extend them exactly that. This is an embodiment of what uh, computer security experts call uh, the principle of least authority. Um, although if you trust someone, you can actually go over least authority and you can extend all the way up to how much you trust somebody uh, in a phenomenon known as social collateral. Um, you're collateralizing your relationship and that can be strong enough to collateralize loans. You can build trust networks uh, like that. Um, um, in fact, there's, yeah, there's lots of examples of communities using that kind of natural thing um, in, in sociology and economics. Um, okay, uh, I, I think they make ACLs look silly. I, I don't, I don't wanna humiliate anybody who has recently made an ACL. I've made ACLs before, but uh, when you're making an ACL, there's a, there's a variety of ways that it's easy to make things insecure and it's tedious to make things flexible. Um, and so just, I'll give one example. Oh, uh, with an ACL, you're, you always have to explicitly include authorization logic. So you can easily forget something like an only owner modifier that could result in massive loss for your newly deployed uh, wallet contract. Um, when you're using object capabilities, the function invocation has the authorization embedded in it. And so there is no such thing as access without authorization, if composed right. Um, you know, this, this probably requires a consideration down to the EBM down to the ETH 2.0 sharding uh, model, um, you know, at least at the language level. Um, but it could probably be hacked on top of Solidity or something. Um, crowdfunding and DAOs, uh, I honestly think that there's something beautiful in even the, simplicit, uh, the simple composability of people delegating a funding to each other. And I, I think that it is actually incredibly deep and rich. But even if you don't think so, um, uh, hopping back to the, the whole uh, inspiration for this talk, um, even if you think the most interesting thing in, in this whole diagram of all these creative people and all the trust networks that they have available to them, even if you think the most interesting thing there is the, the algorithm that says, uh, well, we'll divide up in proportion to the square of the sum of the contributors, even in that case, well, you might still want to hedge between that. And you know, you're probably not going to put all your money into it and you're still going to put some towards groceries. And so embracing the fact that people have weight to the things that they trust um, it's, it's, I think, a very natural and user-centric way of modeling security and cooperation. Um, uh, I have a section where I can go into more on caveats. I think there's some potential to make uh, really interesting caveats because they can be Turing complete. So if I give you a function, I could write a closure around it and I could have arbitrarily complex logic restricting your use of it. It's an interesting exercise. We don't need to go into it right now. Um, some people get scared of fully asynchronous programming, and I just want to say JavaScript's promises perfectly model this already. They show us how to write async uh, object capability empowered language. Um, so actually JavaScript promises uh, were invented for the E language in OCAP centric language by Mark Miller. So this is, uh, it's all coming full circle. We just need to kind of take these lessons that have been sitting here on the table and, uh, and authorize them and uh, utilize them. Um, yeah, okay, I, this thing, sorry for being uh, so long. I got carried away prepping for this. It's, it's, like, awesome. it's a topic I love, um, obviously. Awesome. Okay, um, modular authentication. Oh, right, so, so far we were mostly talking about signatures, but if you wanna authorize either off-chain signatures or other contracts, there's some consideration that has to go into that. Although I think that once you modularize it, um, it should be easy enough to make a module that, for example, accepts your Cosmos interchain communication thing or a relay to you know, BTCX or whatever. Um, so, so I think that you can use the OCAP model to model basically communication with any remote entity, be it on the same blockchain, a different shard, different, uh, different blockchain or a different computer or whatever. Um, so, so really, really, I think the dream is that we write our code once and then interact with anything, you know, but that's a very infrastructure first uh, perspective. You know, write your code once, interact with anything. That sounds like a tattoo to me. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, that's it's a dream. It's a dream. I mean, I'm I'm fantasizing here. This is I'm 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 giving you a dream for sure. Um, uh, and then uh, yeah. Anyways, I think that more people should think about this and work on this. I think that if Ethereum doesn't embrace a security model like this, uh, we're gonna find ourselves doing a lot of synchronous programming that is prone to reentry attacks and uh, isn't very scalable because the shard limit is you know finite or whatever. Um, and, and at the same time, I think that there's incredible 
a scalability and composability uh, that comes from it. So I've got a fat sack of you know of fun some fun reads that you can check out. I've dropped it in the chat and I'll be sharing soon. Um, so uh, sorry if I went over. No, I did pretty good, right? You did yeah, great, man. You did yes. Oh, that's fifteen minutes. Oh man, I thought I was gonna go for like a okay. Yeah, so I I went too fast, but whatever. No, no, you went the perfect amount of time, and we have a fun set of questions that have come up in the chat as you've been talking. I think people have been really excited about this. I think wow, we could go a lot of different ways. Um, the first that I would note is. Everyone definitely check out the hack MD file in the chat. Um, and for the folks that are watching on Twitter, we can post it um, just as a thread to the live stream um, because I think the hack MD is an awesome resource that everyone should, should read. Um, I think, let's see, the first question that um, I saw a couple of people asking about was the sub subscriptions of subscriptions concept. Um, so, could you talk a little bit more about that? Maybe even a step up from, from OCAP, just like what you think that could be useful for and, and then how, yeah, how it is constructible now using OCAP, I guess is also worthwhile. Yeah, well, I think, I think a lot like Sasha was saying, like I, I think that one of the best goals we can have out of the decentralized ecosystem is uh, commensurately compensating people for their contributions, right? So we just wanna, we wanna get closer to giving people what they're worth, right? Um, so, and, and, and I think the farm futures model is a great one. So, so let me just r riff with that a little more. So if I wanted to start a farm, um, and I want to start, you know, so if I go to a bank and I say, I'm going to start a farm, they're going to look at me, they're going to be like, well, you know, where's your business plan, whatever. They're mm -hmm. giving me the full cold, uh, you know, size up right now. If I go to my friends and I say like, Hey, I'm thinking of starting a farm. I'm like, here's the gear I've got so far. You know, you may think it's more likely for me to do it. Uh, and, and so your, your value on that future might actually be higher. And so your cost of risk is lower, especially because people are um, less inclined to default on their friends. Um, and, uh, yeah, if I can even jump in on that. And on, on top of that, the risk is mitigated and offset by the existing demand of the market for the thing that you're producing. Because there's a market that prices the output of the farm. And so that even that kind of goes beyond to say that there's liquidity in the market as long as you produce uh, the, the intended output, which is food. Right, right. Like you're selling far, future farm tokens. Those are still liquid because they're tokens. And so, right, right. By fundraising, you've still got liquidity. You know, as, that's, I totally think it's one of the great things of, of tokenization. Like we don't have to lock up capital. Even, even more like community focus, like what if, this is sounds like just a little bit to throw it in there. Like, what if you could even use them for redemption for food rather than secondary market trading? Yeah. So, like, what if you could redeem every token for X pounds of tomatoes? Yeah, you know? I mean, isn't that what you want, anyways? That is it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I want burrito tokens. I just want to know I'm going to have a burrito, like you know, once a week for the rest of my life, or you know, you know, maybe daily. Like, you if that can be my thing, right? Up. Right. And like, yeah, and I'm willing to speculate a bit. I mean, you know, if it's especially friends or community or like local people, you know. Uh, big yeah. question, who's gonna register burrito token.io first? That's the big question. Oh man, <laughs> or .eth. You're, you're 10 seconds late, Sasha. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, that totally makes sense. Um, and yeah, I, I thought you might go back to the farm example. I think that's, that's an interesting one. Well, cool, so I'm gonna keep going back through the chat. Uh, we have 10 minutes left, so feel free to add any other questions that you guys have to the chat? Um, one from Sylvain, which is more of a technical question. On meta transactions, how do you transfer the message from off-chain to on-chain? Would you need an external service like an HTTP server? Um, yeah. Why not fund the account by sending the transaction for gas? Um, well, I think if, if the permission to submit your transaction um, is a capability, then you can write a caveat around it to somebody that uh, uh, grants them a fee or, or whatever. So somebody could say, look, I'll only do it in exchange for a fee, for example. Uh, uh, take care. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, that's, that'd be one way of modeling it. Um, so, so if, yeah, so in that case, I'm modeling your transaction. The, the right to submit my transaction is a capability. I'm giving it to anybody. If it's just for anybody, maybe it's got zero cost. If it's got some caveats, I can add caveats like, um, I guess they can be positive caveats. I can say, I'm willing to pay this much for it, right? And so I can shop it around. 
Um, so it could be by anybody, they could be doing it for free or uh, if I add extra permissions around the, the function, um, then yeah, yeah, you could make a market out of it. I'm, I'm sure there's a million creative things that Austin could come up with uh, related to it. Yeah. Yeah, Austin, um, I think the two bow tie Friday dudes should. Uh, and that's good. Like his bow tie is a real tie bow tie. That's a fancy bow tie. It, it, it takes oh, yeah. work to put. This isn't a clip on. This oh, man, I, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it is loose if you, if you. Get <laughs> how many times, how many times did it take you to tie it? Actually, I didn't even have a mirror. It was the first try, but uh, I, I found a video. It must be the good one. Uh, I'll, I'll share the share the link. Yeah, that's share amazing. That video cap stuff, Dan. Both are important. Both are important. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. No. 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 no, no it's just kidding. also important. Um, yes. Both are important. Um, yeah. Let's see. I can't find as. Let's see. There's some other in the question in the chat, but I did one thing that you brought up that was really interesting was the principle of least authority and mm -hmm. why the OCAP model kind of is superior to perhaps even some of the layer two solutions that we have today um, that, that don't benefit from that. Um, how, do you, how do you think about, uh, well, I guess in, in conjunction with that, you brought up uh, trust networks and, and the, the ability to, um, to get a loan from different people that you have different varying levels of trust with. Could you, could you kind of talk about the principle of least authority as like a baseline and then how you level that up depending on, um, on how much or how little you trust somebody? Yeah, so as soon as there's distrust, that's when you start using the blockchain. Uh, so, so to be perfectly clear, if you're selling futures on a token, in order to redeem tokens in exchange for what you're granting me, that needs to be, it basically has to be on chain. I can give you, now on the other hand, I can publish, a, yeah, I can have a counterfactual uh, contract that's a token, and I can have a key that has permission to mint those tokens, and now I can give you permission to mint, you know, 100. So you can mint tokens entirely offline. Uh, what you can't guarantee is that I'm not going to permit many more. Um, and yet, if you're just trusting me that I'm going to produce lettuce at my farm, you're already kind of fundamentally trusting me to deliver on the lettuce. So maybe it actually is already aligned that I'm managing the token supply of the lettuce that I'm producing. Um, I don't know. Uh, that's it, that's a slight slight detour. So there there are kind of multiple questions. I, I, I would slightly uh, reject the notion that maybe state channels don't have principle of least authority. Like, you know, they've got good constrained uh, uh, security, right? You, you deposit in a state channel, you know that's the most you're going to risk. Um, I think the thing that uh, could be been, uh, added uh, by adding object capabilities would be like the composability and the extensibility and even, um, yeah, so, so potentially delegating your right to sign in a state channel to other keys uh, mm -hmm. or other uh, groups of keys and things like that. So that's just an example of that. And then you also asked about trust networks. Correct. The same one. Um, yeah, trust networks are one of my favorite parts of it though. So if we're not talking about, let's say, very concretely needing something in exchange. So like I'm making a token swap, like that's because we don't trust each other. But if we're saying, okay, it is much more speculative futures. Okay, I'm gonna grant you up to you know hundred bucks for your farm gear. I accept this counterfactual token for your lettuce. I'm not even gonna go to, gonna go to the blockchain because I already know it's worthless unless you deliver. Really, I'm granting you this because I, I trust you, right? So when there is higher trust, uh, usage of the blockchain can go down. And uh, I think object capabilities give you a very seamless model to allow uh, situations with more trust to move off the blockchain very fluidly. So you get this kind of blockchain trust gradient. Um, today, it's it's more like all or nothing, one or the other. Yep. Uh, I think I think a composition model that lets you move on or off, or you know, or seamlessly to may, maybe the, that network's okay for this, or you know, maybe right. this small quorum is enough, or whatever. Right. Yeah. This reminds me a lot of the social identity stuff that Glenn Whale has been talking about, because, um, like, I guess, given that it's completely, it may be a completely different. Um, structure from, from what he's building, but they have like a Microsoft research group that's thinking about the idea of we don't want it to be all or nothing. And we want to be able to like, kind of like seamlessly navigate because identity is like that. And right. everyone has different identities in different situations and um, in different ways that that trust evolves. And for that to be fluid is, is much more important um, than, than the all or not, well, not, all, not more important, but it is as important as the all or nothing nature of, um, of kind of how like putting it on chain. Um, yeah. Can be. I, I did have a conversation with him about how to manage identity uh, for uh, liberal radicalism using social collateral. Apparently he, um, I guess, had worked with the guy who wrote one of my favorite social collateral papers. 
Um, but his approach was to kind of break up the component ver verifiers of the identity. Uh, I, I want to learn more about it. Um, I would love to see what they come up with. Um, but but yeah, my, my model is maybe maybe very rudimentary. It's just hedge between the uh, authenticators that you uh, that you trust in proportion to how much you trust them. Sure. Um, or better, just extend trust to the people you trust, right? And then let them delegate that. Right, right. Let it flow from there. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. Okay. Any questions from the crowd that we did not get through the chat? Dan, I got a few questions. Actually, I have two. Um, so I know, you know, we've talked a little bit about this or very briefly, but you mentioned you might be incorporating this into MetaMask that allow kind of people to hook into this. Um, are you still thinking about the place that OCAP LD will have in MetaMask? And is there like, not a timeline, but a rough estimate of when you want to kind of see this incorporated into the extension? So, so uh, like I kind of mentioned, like, yeah, I think that this belongs in wallets. And I think that it benefits more if it's more intercompatible. And that's part of why I'm like uh, coming on a live stream. Like I'm like, I think that this benefits from uh, community coordination and, and other wallets have started to get the inkling that maybe we should have permissions and we should log into apps with like limited uh, contract enforced permissions. But I think they're still getting on that ACL route where your permissions are one tier deep. They don't have that delegatable thing. They, they don't have that kind of uh, off chain flexibility. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think that this is an important paradigm to get out there, uh, to start exploring, seeing if we can standardize around it. And yeah, I think that wallets should be, uh, graceful at managing these, graceful at logging in and delegating these to sites or friends. And, uh, and whether the serialization format is OCAP LD, OCAP LD is a cool W3C standard. Um, and I think reading their spec gives a really good idea of what should be involved in a capability serialization standard. but um, you have, we have other things we have to consider when we're talking about like messages within the same blockchain. Like we don't, you know, contracts don't sign messages. So there's, there's other considerations also. And then meanwhile, there's so other projects like, like a, a yeah. 2020 goal for MetaMask then it won't happen in 2019. I mean, I think there are versions of it that can be achieved uh, sooner, but uh, yeah, like the full, the fullest version of this. Yeah, it, it might. I mean, I think that we are going to continue iterating towards it, basically. I, I think the fullest version will be on the, the full, you know, any point in the future, we'll have the latest version we ever had. Um, cool. And I have one minor, one other question. Um, so obviously, there's a lot of potential with kind of this approach. And like, there's so much, you know, Ethereum is known for like really pie in the sky thinking and like, we are going to disrupt everything. But what do you think would be the lowest hanging fruit of being able to like kind of validate this approach? And whether it's just like really trivial, like on Rinkeby and some minor thing um, or something else. What do, you, what do you see that maybe could be hacked on in like three, four, six weeks to kind of validate this idea? Sure, sure. I think the, the very lowest hanging fruit, I'm gonna push it so low that it's like, it's like, you'll be like, is that useful? Okay, so how about just the ability to, given a contract account, like I would use the Gnosis Safe as a starting point because it supports plugins. So now I would want to define a plugin uh, such that it can receive a message or series of messages that imbue um, just the right to send a function. So to start, I would have no caveat system. The caveat system is really where it gets fun and crazy difficult and, and nuanced. Um, but I think the simplest version is just permission to call a function. So then we can start messing with, you know, de delegating my right to vote, you know. So now you've got liquid democracy built on anything that supports that. Uh, or actually, since that function would be built on the uh, personal identity, now contracts wouldn't actually need to implement this at all, right? This would be a user, an end user thing. So it's possible we could add this at the user account layer and then the ecosystem could start to benefit. Um, so yeah, delegating a single function. And then if I, if I was gonna go one step further, I really, really am looking forward to spending permissions. So that's a stateful caveat. It's not the easiest one, but I think delegating spending permissions it has like the biggest social implications. Cool. So something around voting then is would be you think the lowest thing. Voting, yeah, yeah. Although if you want to modulate, if you want to to attenuate the vote at all, like limit them to this vote or any of that, now you need a caveat. Oh, we're getting complicated. Just yeah, yeah. So that's start with yeah. voting. Yeah, yeah. So delegating your vote within a given uh, contract, yeah, that that would be like a, a good example. Yeah, and uh, like with cool. with the TCR or something, right? That's already a useful feature. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, 
if you yeah. have time, I'd love to see if we can get this in Mesha maybe in the next like couple of months and test it out. It would be super fun. I, I think an MVP wouldn't be hard. Um, it, the harder part is getting a robust and resilient thing. Um, yes, of, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, we should um, we should spec something out for the Ethereum hackathon. That sounds like a cool cool project right there. Yes, yes. Uh, let's start a uh, thread or a chat. Yeah. Think it, is this more of a ETH magicians or an ETH research thing? Or, uh... <laughs> I think it's probably somewhere in between, which is not a bad thing. It can go to both places and see okay. see who's interested. Um, but yeah. Um, unfortunately, we do have to end the call a bit early today. But Dan, this is super interesting. Um, I would second what you just said about um, delegated spending. That's something that we've been thinking a lot about and Austin has been doing a lot of cool work around. Um, and we're excited about um, everything that you just described, at least I know I am. And um, yeah, thank you again for joining and thank you everyone as always for joining the live stream. Cool, thanks so much. Thanks for making a space for it. All right, Yeah. Thank you and thanks everyone. Yeah. Happy Friday. Happy, Happy Friday. Friday. Happy Bowtie Friday. Loved it, <laughs> loved it. See you guys. Take care. Bye bye. Bye, bye. get going. Bye, Kames. Bye. bye. <laughs> All right, bye bye. <laughs>